It is Wednesday, September 12th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very productive get your ass kicked at Jiu-Jitsu Wednesday. Uh, we actually did a lot of guard passing. Um, some some uh, X-Pass and some... Uh, some control, uh, what's it? Control, control, something. Control tower, control position, uh, passing. Kind of, it, it all kind of morphed into smash passing <laughs> with me because that's kind of what I do um, with that type of pass. Um, but it was uh, it was interesting to tap on on these today. Um, but it, it felt really good. It, the the uh, type of pass that we were doing. Um, you put your uh, put your thigh up against one uh, the back of their one of their thighs or like your shin right up against the back of one of their thighs and then um, pass them you know just like uh, like one we had uh, a staple where you would staple the thigh down with uh, by putting your knee over it you know having having it between your uh, your knee and your ankle and while having the the other leg up on your shoulder, uh, we actually went went over two passes from there. Um, we went over the uh, pass from the right way, where where you uh, step out and go go to the other side, and then we we did the the one from the same side, where you know you got you got the, your uh, leg up on your shoulder, and you uh, reach across and grab a lapel, right, and then you just kind of back your head out and and shuffle their their leg over. And then uh, get into side control and get that choke. <laughs> but yeah, so it was uh, it was pretty interesting. I almost got a a really interesting choke today. Um, it was the first time I've ever had somebody in the position for it, but it's it's a weird variant of the um, of a uh, <clears throat> I can't remember the fucking choke um, Ezekiel. Um, but it's not really an Ezekiel. I mean, if I if I'd have had my a grip on my sleeve it would have been an Ezekiel but um, it, it was really close to that and I think if I if I was trying to put it away meaning if we weren't just passing one another's guard uh, that I might have actually gotten it um, but yeah it was a uh, it was good um, you know I felt a little better than I did on Wednesday although I didn't feel bad Wednesday I just it's it's one of those things where if I spend more than two days away from the gym I start getting amnesia when it comes to uh comes to jujitsu uh but yeah like i said it was a, it was an all-around good class i i didn't get my ass kicked the entire time i kicked a teeny tiny bit of ass and you know just enough to get by until the next time i'm out there on the mat well it's with that i want to go ahead and kick into our first dance i have not picked anything out of course and one of these days, I don't know, I, I actually prefer it this way, where I'm just going free-balling it. I was thinking about if I were to do this as a video, like uh, how, what kind of stuff I would do to make it a video. And, and honestly, because it's a, it's a radio show, and I don't really have as much time to pre-plan a lot of things, um, I think a visual element might be a little bit distracting. But you never know. Sometime in the future, that may be a thing. But just not today. And as far as what we're going to put in for our first dance, I was talking to somebody online today, and they'd said, or no, they'd uh, just tweeted, uh, real eyes, real eyes, real lies. And when I heard that, or when I saw that, I'm like, oh yeah, we're definitely going to be playing block tonight. So here it is for our first dance. Realize, realize, real lies. And then the song that it's an intro for, Block, by Machine Head, here on Coin Metal. And that was Wait for Something Wild by Sixth. God damn, I love that band. <clears throat> Anywho, as far as what we're going to get into today... I had a couple things in particular that I do definitely want to cover, and uh, 
I, I've made a point on this show to uh, to indicate something about mining that I, I think a lot of people tend to ignore. And that's that when hardware manufacturers make some sort of iteration improvement, uh, regardless of what it is, immediately they start considering that implementation on other hardware that they're currently operating or making so you know when they when they get some size improvement you know they get down from from 16 nanometer down to 10 nanometer or 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer as the case may be um, whenever that happens everybody else starts looking at, at their iteration change too and starts saying well gosh maybe we ought to do that too and try and stay competitive with these guys or watch them eat our lunch. One of the two, you know. And so I, I've been making this point about mining. And I think for the most part it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. Only because most people don't a actually have the experience of working in a fab like I do. Now I'm not saying I'm like, you know, some diamond or something like that. That nobody understands this. So I'm just saying that... The, there's not too many people that have actually done the 12 hour you know the 12 hour shifts three to four days a week minimum and uh, doing it you know processing some sort of way for you know which whatever it may be whether it be RAM or CPUs or GPUs or whatever the process is relatively similar anyway when I was doing this they they took a great deal of time and effort and put it into trying to train us about what we were doing you know it wasn't enough for them for us to simply be able to press the buttons and move the move the lot on to the next step they wanted us to understand the basic fundamentals of what we were doing because i'm sure somebody said you know if these people come up with any kind of improvements on what we're doing we want to be able to quickly integrate it into what we're already doing and if they're familiar with what we're already doing and more than just what they're doing as a daily job they'll probably be that much more apt to find improvements that can be implemented in their department and elsewhere well that, that doesn't stop which is manufacturing tweaks and whatnot <clears throat> it goes all the way to design specs and I've been saying all along that mining is probably the greatest driver of hardware development in in consumer computing right now and, and I would say computing in general right now and the reason is is that these hardware manufacturers they want your business and I know NVIDIA makes noises like they don't really want your business, but they want your business. Your money is just as good as anybody else's. Let's just get real here. You know, if they're having issues addressing their uh, their normal market and us, they they got to fucking get bigger. You know, get get another fab or two. Hire some people. Get that shit running. Let's go. You know, but the... Uh, the drive has been, in my opinion, a push away from mining. And I see this as a, a fucking mistake. Because the thing that makes any of this shit worth it is us investing our time and effort in it. If we don't do that, it's not worth it. So, you know, this whole bullshit kumbaya idea that you know, we're going to do everything off chain and we're never going to have to touch down to the blockchain and we don't really need miners and they suck up an awful lot of energy. Yeah, you know what? They're also why this happened. Apple and Hawaii both claim 7 nanometer smartphone chips. Let that sink in for a moment. 7 nanometer. Okay, Intel is still putting out CPUs right now. And these are like cutting edge, bleeding edge motherfucking CPUs right now. 10 nanometer. And these guys have skipped down to 7 nanometer. Now there have been claims 
that the 10 nanometer ones are just as good as the 7 nanometer ones, but the point being that the dimensions, somebody is getting their dimensions down to 7 nanometer, all right? The first place I heard about that shit happening was where? Yeah, you got it. Mining! Continuing on. This is on uh, spectrum.ieee.org. <clears throat> At an event today, Apple executives said that the new iPhone XS and XS Max will contain the first smartphone processor to be made using 7 nanometer manufacturing technology, the most advanced process node. Hawaii made the same claim to less less fanfare last mo- late last month, and it's unclear who really deserves the accolades. TSMC, which built both Apple's and Hawaii's chips, went into volume production with 7 nanometer tech in April, and rival Samsung is moving toward commercial 7 nanometer production later this year or in early 2019. Global Foundries recently abandoned its attempts to develop a 7 nanometer process, reasoning that the multi-billion dollar investment would never pay for itself. <clears throat> I don't know why. <clears throat> and Intel announced delays in its move to its its next manufacturing tech, technology, which it calls a 10 nanometer node, but which may be equivalent to others 7 nanometer technology that claim again. Apple's new A12 Bionic is made up of four CPU cores, six GPU cores, and an eight-core neural engine to handle machine learning tasks. According to Apple, the neural engine can perform five trillion operations per second, an eight-fold boost, and sometimes and consumes one-tenth the energy of the previous incarnation. Moore's Law, bitches. Of the GPU cores, two are designed for performance and are 15% faster than their predecessors. Gosh, I wonder why. It, it couldn't possibly be because of mining. The other four are built for efficiency with a 50% improvement on that metric. The system can decide which combination of the three types of cores it will it will run to a task most efficiently. Hawaii's chip, the Kirin 980, was unveiled at the IFA 2018 in Berlin on August 31st. It packs 6.9 billion transistors onto one square centimeter chip. The company says it's the first chip to use processors based on ARM's Cortex A76 which is 75% more powerful and 58% more efficient compared to its predecessors, the A73 and A75. It has eight cores, two big high-performance ones based on the A76, two middle-performance ones that are also A76s, and four smaller high-efficiency cores based on a Cortex A55 design. The system runs on a variant of ARM's big dot little architecture in which immediate inclusive workloads are handled by the big processors while sustained background tasks are the job of the little ones. Hmm, so it could be mining in the background. Kirin's ni- uh, Kirin 980's GPU co- component is called the Mali G76 and it offers a 46% performance boost and a 178% efficiency improvement from the previous generation. The chip also has a dual-core neural processing unit that more than doubles the number of images it can recognize to 4.5... I'm sorry, 4,500 images per minute. Hmm. It's a lot of fucking images. Let's continue on. And that is the end of it. So there you have it. A shit ton of performance upgrades. Now, I won't take any any claim to the rest of the performance upgrades noted on here, but GPUs, I mean, that's, that's us. 
I mean, anybody want to tell me that that <laughs> that that isn't having some effect? If so, I'm sorry. You do not know anything about the semiconductor industry and how it runs. I mean, I only know a little bit about how it ran, like, back in 2001. And from what I know, I can tell you that they eagerly apply any little iteration upgrade across a vast spectrum of, of uh, architectures. And, you know, when you have somebody like, say, Global Foundries, they're, they're Global Foundries. They've got fucking fabs everywhere. And they're, they're making all kinds of good stuff. But they're not all just, you know, ASICs. They're not all just GPUs for people. They're, they're not all just CPUs. The fact that they're abandoning, abandoning the idea of a 7 nanometer process. Honestly, the only reason to skip a, uh, a um, iteration upgrade that, that significant. I mean, because we were going from an average of 16 nanometer down to 7 nanometer that's kind of skipping ahead of Moore's law there and it's something to what I've been talking about with uh, with companies digging ever deeper into their R&D trove for ideas to be putting into uh, putting into production and trying to get an additional performance advantage over others in the space and I, I think that we are going to see that increasing and that that R&D room is going to get smaller and smaller or at least the amount of stuff they already have on the shelf is going to get smaller and smaller <clears throat> but you never know I, I think that there'll be a it's kind of a rubber banding thing you know where it'll it'll lag behind the market a little bit not not by much and then they'll take a big jump ahead like this. But like I was saying, with a uh, seven nanometer thing, that you know, once you start getting one one particular architecture down that small, the the tendency is to drive everything else that you can make down that small. The only reason why I could think that Global Foundries would not be venturing into seven nanometer while their competitors are, is that either a they really don't think they can do it and and there's just no conceivable way that it's going to uh going to be profitable enough or b they're working on a five nanometer architecture and given the nature of the uh the market and how we've seen things blossoming over the last few years i would say that's probably the more likely thing that uh, they're they're either prototyping or uh, or stepping up right now, and and that means that they're uh, they're reviewing some some of their fabs and deciding which one to implement it in, and possibly possibly as far as actually setting up hardware, you know. But it does take quite a bit of um, quite a bit of capital to revamp a uh, a fab for a, a iteration upgrade like this so like I said I, I think the likelihood is that there's they're probably they probably got something smaller on the board <clears throat> either that or a more efficient seven nanometer design I don't know but who's to say you know they, they might be looking at different dopants or something like that or or different mediums it might even be skipping off of silicon entirely which I don't think would be a good idea, but you never know. You never know. But yeah, this is something that I see is being driven as being driven by by mining. That the demand for new hardware and the demand for better performing hardware is pushing hardware developers a little bit harder than they've been pushed by any other technology. I mean, we're talking we're talking about things like you know internet, and then uh, maybe streaming video, streaming audio. Okay, we've got that stuff pretty well covered. I mean, we're we're all the way up to 8K, and we're not even ready to put that out yet. You're still releasing TVs with 
what is it, a 1080 or 1080i or some shit like that. Whereas the there are standards available. I think that I think they're all the way up to 12k. I'm not 100% sure on that, but the the point being that the market isn't as as linear as it used to be, and there there's a lot of how should I say it? Um, I don't know. It seems like a lot of the hardware is is still kind of lagging behind. You know that they they have been slower to catch up to to what's actually available and what we're actually capable of doing, and I really think that's a reflection of demand. You know that you have you are still onboarding people to just the internet and just smartphones and shit like that. You know and the they haven't reached <clears throat> a significant enough um, threshold for that to be less of a concern. You know. And so, you know, they're kind of lagging behind in other things. Like, there, there's plenty of people developing things for, like, AR and VR and stuff like that. But, they're, at least here in the, in the United States, we're not really seeing a whole lot of penetration with those. I mean, or at least I'm not. And it, it could be because I'm not using them. But, it could be because they're simply not available. And because it's not, it's not really a public knowledge kind of thing. You know, and I think it's really interesting though that we should live in a time when there's so much technology available, and we're still living like we're in the 1950s. I mean, by all accounts, we should be flying by now. Everybody should be flying by now. But for whatever reason, we're still driving around on fucking four wheels in a relatively inefficient manner. I don't know, maybe it's just a lag, you know, that maybe there's other places here in the U.S. and abroad where they're far more technologically advanced than they are here in the sticks. Could just be location. But from what I'm seeing as far as, you know, the kind of media that I'm seeing people post and whatnot on social media, it tells me that a lot of this technology isn't being, isn't really being utilized yet. You know, so when people tell you things like, oh, you know, uh, Bitcoin's over, you know, cryptocurrencies are dead, they're so full of shit. They're so full of shit. And w- what bugs me the most is that there's still people that think you can plan this thing. You know, it, it's so dependent upon actual feedbacks from the public. And when I say feedbacks, I mean things like hardware development, things like software development. These are all contingent upon what we actually use. Because we'll buy the hardware to use it a certain way, to do a certain thing, you know? And, and our demand for that hardware reflects an interest in using those things. And, and it's just not there yet. You know, I, I think that it's it's due to the fact that we're still having to onboard significant ports, parts of the population onto the internet. And that in itself, I think, is because there have been too many artificial roadblocks to that. I mean, I remember a time when Kmart was giving free internet access. If they had a, if they had a um, access point anywhere near you that you can <clears throat> reach with your modem um, and, and get a, a half-decent connection with, and the, the only requirement was that they had this little pop-up thing in the bottom corner of your screen. I mean, you could easily put stuff over it, no problem. Um, but that was it. You put that on there, and and Kmart gave you free internet access. Now, was it the quality that could be provided by a quote unquote, or what you would expect to be provided by a quote unquote public utility? No. But that wasn't important. It got us on the fucking internet for free. That's what was important, but that's not an, that's no longer possible. Just the regulatory drag alone is too much to make that an available thing. You actually have to be making money off of, I mean, significant amounts of money from people connecting through you in order to even bother. 
and again, I think that's it's just one of those things where there's some group of fucking people and they want the majority of the market and they'll do anything to keep everybody else out. And, you know, I, I'm always afraid that that's going to happen in crypto. But then again, I keep thinking back to the fact that if that ever really did become, if any crypto became too difficult to use, impossible to use without AML, KYC, all that other bullshit, um, I think somebody would invent another cryptocurrency that didn't require AML, KYC, and we'd start using that one instead. I, I don't see this as a game that, that's linear or that will end anytime soon. You know, the demand is for freedom, for freedom to commerce with who we choose, when we choose, and at the terms that we agree to. Is, you know, it's, it's just too much at this point to be ignoring it. I, I think, you know, you just basically you just want to step outside of it you know if it's if it's not if the commerce itself isn't going to negatively impact you in terms of you know maybe limit the possibility of you continuing to exist you know they're buying guns and bullets and shit like that and they're arming and and training people with the money that they're doing that they're making from cryptocurrency okay now now we're talking about something that may directly negatively impact you personally you might want to do something about that. But the rest of it, you know, people selling their handmade goods or their homemade goods online for cryptocurrencies, ignore it. It's nothing. What it's going to equate to, though, is that those people are going to have a source of income that they never had before. They'll be creating a market that never existed before. And they'll be getting income that never existed before and they'll spend it to buy stuff that they could never buy before got to keep that in mind but anyway so as we were saying with seven nanometers i think that's primarily driven from miners that if we didn't have miners pushing the hardware market for the last four to five years in a very significant way that we would not be talking about 7 nanometer chipsets and smartphones. We'd be talking about 16 nanometer smartphone chips. And we'd be happy. We'd be fucking ecstatic. But no, the miners have pushed the envelope a little too far for that. But yeah, <clears throat> I expect that that is going to be continuing on too. That's not something that's just like a flash in the pan going to be here today and tomorrow kind of bullshit but you know it's it was funny for a while there we were hearing people say shit like moore's law is bullshit somebody actually said that to me on twitter can you believe that you know you're sitting in front of a computer that has like 80,000 times as much computing power as the the first computer that you sat in front of and you type the words, Moore's Law is bullshit. I, 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 the only words I could describe that with would be cognitive dissonance. You're just not getting it, man. It's, it's, not, it's not connecting. But that, that's not something that, that just ends. You know? It's not just going to end. We're not going to stop making shit that's more efficient than the shit we made last year. The drive is to make it more efficient so we can make more money because we want to sell more units. <sighs> like, that's that drive is just going to go away. I'm, I'm not going to want a, a faster, fucking better iPhone than I had last time around. Fuck you. Fucking Moore's Law is bullshit. <laughs> anyway... I've got this other article here. It's on uh, BitcoinExchangeGuide.com. Bitmain versus ByteWee. Bitcoin mining rivalry. Industry giant or well-funded what's miner crypto chip maker. Okay, whatever the fuck. And this is by Bitcoin Exchange Guide News Team. Authored September 12, 2018. So that was today. 
Uh, no indication of time or location. Okay. All right, continuing on. Bitmain has been going through a lot lately, giving them a less than pleasing reputation. Coindesk recently reported that Bitmain was preparing for their initial public offering, which was meant to be launched in September. However, this seemingly good news has not been well received. On the social media front, investors have done everything from claiming that they do not have money to to predict I'm sorry claiming that they do not have money to predicting a positive financial future okay well, uh, unfortunately this array of reports has resulted in many investors withdrawing their funding hmm in a new development Bitmain is experiencing some competition Bitwe Bitwe is based in Shenzhen and and they manufacture they manufacture mining chips. The effort was established by Yang Yang Zuzing, which, which many people remember as the former director of Bitmain, and he has already raised about 140 yuan, which is approximately 20 million dollars. The first goal is to bring in mar market mining chips that will help to compete against other cryptocurrencies. The COO of, of Bixin, Tyler, Z Tyler Zong, Zong, who was part of the initial investment in Bit, in Bit Bitewe, called the What's Miner line of, of mining chips from, his com from this company a, quote, game changer. Bitewe has been around since July 2016, and many people consider it to be one of the most efficient types of hardware that is presently being sold in the industry, and, e and even the market. Based on the results of testing, their work in progress, what's minor M10, is planned to be about 30% more effective than the flagship product of the company, Antminer S9 Hydro. At this point, due to the promising reports about the new mining rigs, there are presently over 1,000 units on pre-order. Though the product will not be launched until September 19th, but the pre-sale has already begun in August. Each mining chip costs about $1,600, but there are variations based on the shipping batch, which means that the chips could easily bring in a revenue of, of above $1.6 million. Still, Bitewe is far from finished in, with their progress. Based on the IPO content, Bitmain presently is in control of over 85% of the market that sells it, so they have major dominance over it. They also have a business that turns out compatible software, ensuring that the BTC.com and Antpool mining pools can support about 30% of the miners on the network. With such a large portion of the market, there are many cryptocurrency developers that believe that there is a direct conflict between open access and related protocols and the rewards they offer. Even with the What's Miner product, products being available for pre-sale, there's excitement about the providers that could revolutionize the industry. The CEO of Obelisk, David Borick, believes that the fact that Bitwe is succeeding and thriving is proof enough to demonstrate the, the availability for competition. He said, quote, There should be a lot more players in the Bitcoin mining space and a lot more manufacturers, especially if we can figure out everything that What's Miner is doing to get the efficiency gains that they have been getting. There, ha there are many others in the industry that disagree, saying that the only true way to test out Bitewe is to see it in action and prove that it will not go bankrupt like predecessors. Xiong said, quote, It takes a lot, luck, luck included, for a company to grow to that size and influence. It is hard for a new hardware company to get that influence now. Besides, there are only 4 million bitcoins left to mine. Yeah, but there's plenty of other cryptocurrencies, dude. However, it is hard to ignore the initial success they've had, they have had, which is beyond what others have done. 
To promote the pre-sale of What's Minor M10, ByteWeed published some of their testing results, which claim that their device can use under 68 watts per 1 trillion hashes. In, com- in comparison with their Antminer S9 Hydro, the original product was only able to achieve about 96 watts per 1 trillion, which means more, fi- more energy expenditure. Yet, next, Yang wants to release a 7 nanometer chip Bitcoin miner in 2019. Vork remained bullish on his, in his belief that the competitive edge that ByteWe has, especially in comparison with other startups in the industry. Vork said, quote, It seems like the majority of the design talent at Bitmain is now at what's minor, ByteWe. That is probably why Yang seems fairly comfortable with the competition, since Bitcoin is, is inching below the $7,000 line. According to Coindesk, Yang said, quote, The market always has ups and downs, and 2018 is somewhat like 2014, during which the price kept, kept declining for a year. He also added, quote, Nothing can stop the enthusiasm for people inside the industry. Outsiders may hesitate, like Intel or NVIDIA, but not us. Yang has been involved with the mining community for quite a while before now. He went to Tsinghua University, where he got a PhD in engineering physics. He was a chip designer with ASIC Miner in 2014, and he was responsible for introducing what would be Bitmain's Antminer S7 in 2015. Upon realizing that he, quote, didn't feel respected at Bitmain, he kept working on the Antminer S7 while working on on a new side project. When Bitmain released it, Yang kept the ownership of his designs. As his, contact, uh, as his contract ended in June 2016, he started ByteWe within a month. The investors in, his, in this project included some major players in the industry, including F2 Pool's Wang Chun and Ma- Mao Shixing and Wu Ying, chairman of China Capital Group. These transactions made for a clear rivalry between ByteWe and Bitmain, which has only gained more traction over the last two years. In fact, Bitmain went so far as to file a lawsuit for patent infringement based on the use of the technology that ByteWe used for What's Miner, which Bitmain received a patent for in 2016. However, The patent was invalidated by China's State Intellectual Property Office within a month. According to the statement, SIPO said, If a technological solution sought by a patent has different characteristics than existing technologies, but such difference is public knowledge, then it is obvious the solution would incorporate this public knowledge. That's, That's... Exactly my feeling for all of these companies that are doing quote unquote uh, blockchain patents and cryptocurrency patents. Take them to fucking court. Challenge them in fucking court. That's the kind of response you're going to get. This shit is all based on prior art. Continuing on. Yang hopes to make ByteWe the new innovator in the mining chip maker business. He said quote. Full custom methodology can be applied to literally every type of chip. He then added, quote, Our miner's market share may go above 50%, but our own hashing power will never go above 50%. In fact, 10% will already be good enough. Good enough. And so there you have it. Competition coming into the hardware market. Now, There's something, and I don't know if you guys caught this, um, but between the last article and this article, we've we've heard mention of a company that previously has announced great intention to be uh, a major player in the cryptocurrency mining space, and that is Samsung. Um, They are huge too. And I'll tell you what, if they get serious about mining... Oh, good lord. 
everybody currently in, in mining is going to basically be turned on their head, I think. That Samsung, they've got a great deal of experience <coughs> in making hardware that's just that much better than a lot of other shit that's available at the same price. And uh, with that being said, they've, they've been dominating in, in pretty much every other segment of the uh, of the consumer consumer uh, computing market out there. And so their inclusion into the mining space, I, I think a lot of people should be worried about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, they're, if their bread and butter is from cryptocurrency mining and mining chips, they should certainly be worried about Samsung getting in. But, I, you know, I think that mining, it's going to go, I think, one of two ways. That, number one, it's going to be fucking ubiquitous. It's going to be something that everybody can do, and you're going to be able to mine whatever fucking cryptocurrency you want, just like now, and there's not going to be anybody saying guff about it. Now, of course, the taxation on your earnings may change, but I think that... And, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but so far what I've read, it seems to me like the best option is this. That if you're if you're spending cryptocurrency as money and there is a a deno- a cash denominated value for whatever it is, assume that the price that you pay in whatever currency you use as assume that as a quote unquote assumed profit or realized profit rather sorry realized profit they you know so say you buy something that's twenty dollars you know you buy twenty dollars worth of video game coins or some shit like that if you're doing it on a uh, on a market that typically ex- it does its transactions in dollars but is accepting cryptocurrency and they do have a price for it there the price that you pay for it in cryptocurrency reflected in in whatever your national currency is in my book is con- is considered or can be considered as realized profit also if you do something like you take some funds and you in their crypto funds right you take them to coindesk and you sell them for us dollars and then you have those us dollars put into your bank account at that point, you have assumed a profit, or not assumed a profit. You've you've realized a profit, rather. And as you have realized that profit from, you know, from cryptocurrency, it's wholly legitimate. You could back up every every claim that you make. You know, if some if somebody wants to audit your shit, you know, you just want to save your uh, your transaction records and shit like that as far as you can. Um, <clears throat> But the, the point being that I, I don't believe that the money is a quote-unquote realized profit until it's either spent as money or spent for money. You know, if you're, if you're exchanging it for U.S. dollars or Chinese yen or your other national currency, in my book, that is a realized profit. If you spend your cryptocurrency as money, the cash value is a realized profit. That's... An easy way to look at it when you're talking about taxes. I mean, because you can you can find all of your transactions and say, you know, yep, I did one this month, I did one the next week, I did one the, the week after that, and a month after that, I did another one. But those those can be total uh, tabulated. You know, you can tabulate the amount of those transactions and assess your quote unquote realized profit for that year. Now you can establish what your income is based on what your losses were. Now, just like I don't believe you should have to claim your transactions, I don't believe that you should be able to count your losses unless it's a loss that happens outside of the exchange. You know, so you agree with somebody that you're going to give them money and they're going to give you money and they don't give you the money that's a loss you, and if that's your business you know you might have to get a license for it um, but the point being that 
there are there are ways to report him, you know. But now, if you just lost your ass on, you know, Bitmex or something like that, no, you, no, you can't. I don't think you can anyway. You know, just like it's not realized profit until you spend it. You know, either for fiat currency or <laughs> or some sort of uh, product for cryptocurrency. Uh, it's not actually a profit yet. Your money's still on the table, you know, usually. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And, uh, you know, I haven't been playing any Slipknot lately. And I think we should resolve that. And so, as far as what's... You know what I haven't played in a million years on this fucking show? Custer. Here it is, Custer by Slipknot. Here on Coin Metal. I cut it a teeny tiny bit early, man. That's, that song just, it gets me every time. Talk shit, get shot by body count. Gotta love it. Well, as far as what we were going to get into, other than what we've already gotten into, I do have, I do have a few others. And, uh, I do have a couple other directions I wanted to go in here. Oh, <laughs> I gotta do this one just because this this is like like one of my pet things, you know. Um, it's it's just something that I've I've paid attention to quite a bit, and uh, yeah, and, and there seems to be a lot of this action going on. Like a whole bunch of these have spawned lately. Personally, I do not believe they are they are economically viable, um, and apparently neither does this guy. So here it is. This is on CryptocurrencyNews.com. Are stable coins viable? One Berkeley professor says no. And this is by Carolyn Harris. So no penis. Uh, this is authored uh, September 12, 2018. Come on, Carolyn. Tell me when, what time, where. Meaning, you know, at a goddamn time zone. Anyway, continuing on. Stable coins are becoming popular. There's no denying it. A number have hit the market this year. In fact, just yesterday, the Winklevoss twins announced the Gemini dollar, the first ever regulated stable coin. Not to mention carbon launched Carbon USD, a US dollar backed stable coin today. And yet, despite the crypto market displaying optimism around the latest trend in the industry, one Berkeley professor provided an alternative view. Apparently, he listens to the show. I don't know. Maybe. Find out. He said there is no indication that stablecoins are viable. Berkeley professor talks stablecoins. Stablecoins are cryptocurrencies pegged to a quote-unquote stable asset which is impossible because uh, never mind continuing that is as simple as it gets the Gemini dollar for instance created by Gemini Trust Co Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss company will be pegged to the US dollar at a one to one ratio but Barry Eichengreen an economics professor at the University of Berkeley said that's that just because these coins can be pegged to reserves of fiat currency doesn't mean they are quote viable sure he admits that stable coins appear to solve problems of conventional cryptocurrencies like bitcoin with these digital currencies trading prices are volatile making their purchasing power unstable yeah generally going up Further, Ike and Green said that because their value is, quote, stable in terms of dollars or their equivalent, stable coins are attractive as units of account and stores of value. Um, what, however, according to Ike and Green, quote, this doesn't mean that they are viable. Changing the mind of the crypto market. It seems unlikely that Ike and Green's comments will cause the crypto market to see a disappearance in stablecoins. 
Yesterday, a well-known crypto player said the Gemini dollar is a sign that the industry's maturing. No, it isn't. It, it shows that some people are fucking stupid. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Tyler and the Gemini, Tyler Winklevoss said the Gemini Trust stablecoin will solve both trust problems and computer science problems. Pfft. Fucking idiot. Two, trust. Building a viable stablecoin is as much of our trust problem as it is a computer science one. While Bitcoin 4 created a system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, a fiat pegged stablecoin requires both both due, due to its reliance on a centralized issuer. Uh, let's see desirable outcomes in a system that relies on at least in part on trust requires oversight. In this context of a stable coin, we submit that the issuer must be licensed and subject to regulatory supervision. From this tr- transparency and examination, oh, dude, it's a transferal of fucking responsibility and trust onto the regulator. That's all it is. Anyway, continuing, uh, we propose that Gemini Trust Company, Gemini, a New York trust company, as the issuer of the Gemini dollar, Gemini operates under the direct supervision and regulatory authority of the New York State Department of Financial Services and is subject to the New York banking law and other applicable U.S. laws and regulations. Gemini maintains the necessary licenses and registrations to lawfully issue Gemini dollars. So they're authorized by these same agencies to create money. Now whether or not they actually have the dollar reserves behind that money at any one time is a whole different story. Continuing on. In a uh, tweet by Tyler Winklevoss, building a stable, a viable stable coin is as much a tr- Okay, yeah, whatever. Continuing on. So the question is, who should we, the people, believe? Divided. Like with most new things, watch from afar before jumping in. How the Gemini dollar does on the market will be an indication of how trustworthy stable coins are. If it flops... Maybe you'll be siding with Professor Professor Barry Eichengreen. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I expect that if there is an exchange that will allow you to short the Gemini dollar, that people are going to short the Gemini dollar at some point or another. Because they're going to be wanting to make money from Tyler and, uh, and his brother. Yeah, I I don't believe in stable coins. I I think yes, you can take a sum of money, and yes, you can say that it's directly associated with your quote unquote stable coin. However, the two things are actually separate things. And because of this, there is no guarantee that you will not debase your stable coin, meaning that you will be using fractional reserve or some other technique in order to maintain your quote-unquote stability, or at least your reported stability. Now, I don't believe that just because you have a quote-unquote blockchain that you are suddenly believable, or that you have any additional layer of trust. And that's because back in 2014, a company called Accenture created a quote-unquote editable blockchain. You know, and I, I've talked about various ways I believe at least it's possible to mimic transactions or to do multiple versions of a transaction or have multiple versions of account in anticipation of of future action, and you could be wrong. You know, the the assumption with a stable coin is that you're quote unquote they, that you're pegging it to something that is stable. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. Gemini dollar, you're not based on something stable. 
And the, the fact is that the U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its purchasing power since its creation. So now if you want to tell me that your, your coin is stable because it's pegged to something that's losing its face value slower than, I don't know, a bushel of tomatoes or something like that, <clears throat> then we're back to bullshit. You know, basically, the the Federal Reserve is debasing the the quote unquote base of I mean the the base of your quote unquote stable coin. So you know, as far as that goes, you're not going to be able to have a stable unit versus Bitcoin because Bitcoin in this context is deflationary, and it's going to become. There's going to come to a very volatile point with regard to Bitcoin and soon because we are heading towards another another happening and try as people might that did affect the mining the mining game quite a bit the last time it happened. See, I think at some point or another in the, in in the relatively near future that improvements due to new players coming to, coming into the mining space, such as Samsung and Intel and IBM and all these other guys, getting serious and saying, you know what, fuck this stupid-ass blockchain bullshit. Why are we trying to think for our customers? Let's just make hardware. And let's try and make hardware better than one another so that we can actually have a competitive market again. I, I, I really think that that's the way it's going to go. That's my, my general feel because, and I've said this multiple times on this show, that nature doesn't accept resistance in, in toxic elements that it doesn't have to. It finds a way around them. You know, if there's unnecessary friction that is inhibiting movement, people will develop ways to navigate around it. <clears throat> I mean, Bitcoin is a perfect example of that. That the liquidity wasn't getting into the hands of the people that really want to do something to change this world. And instead, it's going into the hands of people that want to keep the world the way it was in the 1950s. And that's why we pretty much still live in the 1950s instead of the 21st century. is because of where the money's been going. And so Satoshi Nakamoto got together with a bunch of people and said, let's create a different monetary system that's not dependent on these people. That way, their involvement will be wholly optional on their part. But that they will be leveled in their significance in the global economy to every other competitor, or to that of every other competitor within the space. And that's that's really what has happened. You know, it's taken that that power away from governments, it's taken that power away from central banks, and it's put it in the hands of 12-year-olds. I am Janet Yellen. I am Jerome Powell. It's just a matter of time. If I if I look around and I can't see a cryptocurrency that facilitates my my needs of a cryptocurrency, I'm going to create one of my own. I'm going to hammer down on learning how to code and I'm going to fucking hammer out my own code and I'm going to hash my own Genesis block and I'm going to invite a bunch of friends say hey check out this fucking coin I developed you want to mine it with me and I'll do the Satoshi Nakamoto thing because that's entirely possible and as a matter of fact there are multiple tools out there too short in the process of course there's plenty of resources to study on that are free, that you don't have to go to a college to learn, go on fucking YouTube, get a full education right there. But the the point I'm getting to with this is that this is the reality of the market. Now, I can say those things, but there are people out there that are doing those things right now. And there are people that are learning how to do those things tomorrow. That is the reality that we live in now. And so... The idea that you're going to put your foot in the water and you're going to be able to be stepping in the same river tomorrow, it, it, it's not going to be the same river two minutes from now. There's going to be some change on the terrain. Maybe you don't see it, but it's happening. 
You know, it's a result of your interference of the flow, you know. And somebody was kind of fudding me the other day on, on Twitter about uh, government involvement in mining. And I can tell you right now that that it would be the quickest way for a government to get wrecked. Because no matter how big the mining operation is by the government, there will be a bigger mining operation somewhere else or a more efficient mining operation somewhere else. You know, every time you start up a set of miners, you've put your foot into the water. You've got a limited number a limited number of days when you're going to be operating in pro, in profit for a specific cryptocurrency, be it Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency. And at the at that threshold, you're going to have to choose whether or not you want to continue mining with that hardware on another coin or simply replace it. Well, th that would be the same for the government. It would be cheaper for them to hire miners. You know, outsource it. You know, go to, go to a fucking mining pool and say, hey, we want to rent your hashes. It would be cheaper for them to go, go about it that way. And there's nothing to say they can't. Of course, they've got unlimited funds of fiat in fiat... Uh, to pay for the that rental, so it does it does keep that as a threat, but that's a threat that's existed for quite a while now, you know, and it's it's not one that's actually I think made an incredible difference with regard to the mining terrain out there. You know, I think that the the governments like China, you know, they they've been a little bit stupid in the last year or two with regard to how the image they've been conveying to the public. But I, I'm seeing reports of new mining operations starting up in China. So, you know, when people say that cryptocurrency is dead in China, I think they're full of shit. You know, and the, this uh, profusion of quote-unquote stable coins, I think that might be in response to what's going on with Tether where Chinese traders and others, I'm sure, are using Tether to circumnavigate some issues with regard to their um, their government's regulation of cryptocurrency or cryptocurrency trading. And and so, you know, again, the idea that China is out of the market, eh, bullshit, bullshit. You know, I, I look at, the, at, at China and... The depth of sophistication that I see, you know, being reflected back at me through the kind of involvement that I see on in this space, um, it, it appalls me that the United States isn't more um, more into it. You know, I mean, I, it, it reminds me a lot of a, a video I saw of Russia. You know, Russian school children. They they're about I think twelve to fourteen years of age. And they're all taking turns taking apart a AK-47 and putting it back together again. And they're doing it relatively quickly. Personally, I think that should be going on in the United States, but that's just me. But those same kids, I think, could be learning about cryptocurrencies and could be learning about the value metrics of them. What makes them valuable to people? What might appeal to them more than other currencies? And... You know, I, if we were to be taking that kind of tack with regard to addressing this space, I, I think the United States could get ahead of a lot of people. I mean, we already produce a lot of the IP involved, you know, intellectual property involved with the internet and cryptocurrency specifically, but I think we should be going farther. And I, I really see in cryptocurrencies a... a type of terrain that would be considered like a um, like a war spectrum you know or um, theater rather where you could be waging campaigns against other nations with how much you're encouraging this activity and what kind of impediments that you're trying to place in its way <clears throat> You know, I've said this a multitude of times and I won't quit saying it because 
I, I think it's the reality. And that's that cryptocurrencies are literally the the mad quagmire of the 21st century. And those of you who were alive during the 80s and were conscious of reality going on around you know that mad was mutually assured destruction. And it was a Cold War policy where you know, if we if we learned through spies or whatever that the Ger- the Russians were making better nukes than us, we would try and steal that IP or try to take what we knew of that IP and build on it and do something better. And it was a it's a kind of a loose engagement. You know, they it wasn't really quote unquote war, but it, you know, it was Cold War. Well, this policy of mutually assured destruction was, if you strike me, I've got to be able to strike you back and kill you. Mutually assured destruction. And this kind of carried on until late in in the Reagan era, and it kind of softened a little bit in the Bush era. We had a little, little elbow rubbing with Gorbachev and whatnot. Um, But anyway, the point being that... That that whole dynamic, it pushed technology quite a ways in in aerospace and and space in general, and jets and warfare, <laughs> and it drove it drove industry in a lot of ways. You know, like what we have with today with the cell phone and the internet and GPS and a few other technologies. Those are, those are all like byproducts of that era well now we're faced with a new a new challenge where it's it's not so much a matter of how much how much military force you can you can exercise but your what your contributions are to these global consensus networks and your permissibility of the activity enriching both you and your people. And I think that because it's a shift away from a debt market and more to an actual commodity market, you know, the, these cryptocurrencies, they're units of account with their own system, their own payment systems that you can use to do global finance and global global commerce in exactly the right time too I mean we're, we're starting to get really ahead with regard to uh, moving things around not needing to stay on oil as much and it does seem like there's a concentration by countries or governments these days on trying to build their renewable resources renewable energy resources you know shifting away from fossil fuels and all that bullshit but i think mining again that's that's another place where mining is going to be very very important because mining is very electricity and dependent you know i mean and very energy intensive and i i believe that over the next probably two to five years we are going to be seeing a shift that is going to cause big mining farms to be less and less viable but the size of them will be big enough that they will be in the amount of money they'll be making will be enough that they'll be able to be investing in things like local infrastructure such as expanding renewable resources and we're already seeing where mining companies are starting to invest in the local infrastructure in the small town in the small towns that they're moving to in both Canada and the United States. I, I don't expect that, that I mean that's that's the beginning of the next phase in mining it is going to be not so much where you locate, but what permissibility you have with regard to creating uh, improving the local the local infrastructure so if the if the local government the cities and 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 um, the city and state government are willing to allow you to do certain things 
you know, maybe improve a hydroelectric dam or, or take a dam and replace it with a hydroelectric dam. You know, if you're allowed that kind of latitude, what uh, that, that'll probably cause miners to want to come to your place and <clears throat> not because your current energy prices are, are, uh, are competitive, but from what they're able to discern, a improvement in your electrical output or your electrical infrastructure will facilitate cheaper cheaper energy prices for both them and the local community. And now when you start putting it into that context, it's like, you know this is energy intensive, you know it's profitable, you know it's necessary because people need to be able to spend money, even in places where they can't get their national currency. They still got to eat. They still have to have water. They still need fuel. They still need electricity, if not anything else. And so there's that that need isn't going away. You know, <laughs> if anything, that need is increasing. But as I've seen it, I, I don't believe there is enough urgency with regard to developing the internet inf internet infrastructure and energy infrastructure of our cities and i think that mining is exactly the kind of catalyst that'll drive that and again i think i think as time goes on it's going to be less and less economical to have big warehouses of mining I think they are going to be representing a smaller and smaller segment of the total mining pool out there. You know that that what you're when you're looking at Bitmain, you know, sure they'll have warehouses all over the planet, but they'll represent about 12% of the hashing power because everybody in his neighbor has got some sort of mining rig set up, or every other guy has got some sort of mining rig set up. And they're investing in things like solar panels. So they're reducing their own need being drawn off of the local grid. So that's lowering energy prices for everybody else. You know, again, it, it's an additional demand, but chances are they're probably going to be investing in enough electricity to not only get their, their operations off of the local grid, but also their home. At least that would be my my goal is that you know if I were if I were mining you know if I had a small mining rig set up here which is in the is in between the ears to do at some point or another you know nothing really big six to eighteen eighteen cards maybe a couple a six you know that's I'm sure that's a, how every big ass miner started things is like hmm, yeah you know I'll just do this. And, but anyway, I would be—I would want to displace that energy demand off of my energy bill. You know, so again, solar power, wind power, something to that effect. But in in that investment, of course, I'd be looking at it and saying, you know, sure, I could buy eight panels, and that would cover all of my mining electricity. But if I buy a lot of twelve, I'll get an additional, you know, two to five hundred dollars off per, you know, and and so I'm incentivized to buy just a few more. But if I buy a few more, I'll be displacing the energy demand of my home. You see how that works? And and I I expect this this is fucking just market shit. I'm not just like spinning complete wool here. I'm sure people that are involved in having their own electricity set up on their own house are, are fully relating to what I'm saying here and that they can see that you know solar that's one market that I see a great deal more interest going into I mean because you got this thing burning overhead 12, 12 hours out of your day at least and so why aren't you trying to capture those electrons and you know put them to use I know that's not how it really works but you know you, you, you get what I'm saying, man. It's there. Use it. So stable coins, I don't see them as viable. That was our last story here before I close this tab. Um, and apparently neither does this Berkeley professor. You know, I, I'm we've we've already seen what pegged what happens to pegged currencies. 
is somebody fucking debases them. You know, that happened with Paycoin back in, what, 2014, 2015? They were claiming to have a, uh, a peg, one, one Paycoin to $20. The, the peg lost at all of, I don't know, like six hours, 12 hours, something like that. And they, they got to base and fucked. So yeah, stable coins, it's a no-go. Tether, I, I'm almost certain they're probably printing money out of nothing. And so, you know, I, I think that one, it'll just be a matter of time before some regulatory body catches a glitch in their paperwork and, and then people go to jail. But I, I don't think that just because the Winkle buyer is sitting on a, on a bigger stack of liquidity that it's it's going to be any different from them, for them. You know, they're going to be trying to sustain the market demand for their Gemini coin. And the market demand isn't just New York. So, I mean, any exchanges that, that are operating with people with, with New York... I don't even know if Gemini coin is going to be available outside of Gemini, though. So that's... That's the whole thing, is if it's something that's just on their own exchange and they're already a regulated entity, okay. But just the same, I see that there have been enough hacks out there that I, I don't think that the Gemini twins are going to be uh, <laughs> gonna be any better at this than, than any other exchange has been. And I'm sure they're, they've hired very, very competent people, but I'm... But I'm also convinced that there are people out there that it's just a matter of whether or not they really want to hit you. You know, if it's really worth their time and effort to do it. And, you know, maybe maybe not now, but maybe sometime in the future, the Winklevi will have enough money on the table that somebody, one of these people that I'm talking about will say, I think I'm going to go and take that. Honeypots and uh, and central points of failure are still a thing, kids. They haven't gone away. Anyway, I got this next article here that's on uh, CCN.com. SEC hits two cryptocurrency firms with formal charges. <gasps> the Securities and Exchange Commission has slapped a crypto ex- asset hedge fund and an ICO superstore with penalties. A digital asset hedge fund manager was charged with misrepresentations and registration failures, marking the SEC's first ever enforcement action, finding an investment company registration violation by a a hedge fund manager based on its investments in digital assets. Crypto Asset Management, LP, or CAM, allegedly marketed itself falsely as the, quote, first regulated crypto asset fund in the United States, while actually operating as an unregistered investment company. California-based Timothy Enneking raised $3.6 million in four months during an unregistered public offering, with Enneking falsely claiming at the time that, that he was SEC regulated. By doing this and then investing over 40% of the fund's assets in cryptocurrencies, Enneking broke multiple SEC regulations and was served with a cease and desist letter. The company halted operations and offered buybacks to investors. Cam and Enneking agreed to pay a $200,000 fine. The second company to be hit by the SEC was an ICO superstore called Token Token Lot. In another milestone case, this is the first case charging unregistered broker-dealers for selling digital tokens after the Dow report was published in 2017 advising dealers and investors that digital securities must be federally compliant. Whatever. You you know what that... uh, that demand also lacks <laughs> it also de- it lacks any ability to enforce i mean they can they can do what they're doing now but they're not going to get everybody continuing on 
ran by Lemmy Kugel and Eli L. Lewitt, Lewitt token lot was m- marketed as a way of buying ICO tokens and partake in trading afterward. The company processed orders from 6,100 different investors and dealt in over 200 different digital assets, some of which have now been determined by to be securities by the SEC. I don't give a fuck. Lewitt and Kugel were not registered as securities brokers despite dealing in security tokens and trading company profits for the same. Token lot was operational from February to July 2017 until an SEC investigation led to, led the founders to voluntarily halt operations and offer refunds on unfilled orders. Actions which the SEC's SEC led to lighter penalties, which nevertheless included $471,000 disgorgement fine with a $7,929 in interest as for the company, as well as personal fines of $45,000 each for Kugel and LeWitt. The founders, who neither admitted nor denied the charges leveled against them, will also need to pay to retain the services of a third party to destroy any remaining token lot inventory. Uh, no. Security charges are coming. The charges are likely a sobering outcome for the many unregistered or non-compliant companies and individuals throughout the U.S. who have been dealing in what the SEC is now classing security tokens, and given that dozens of crypto startups are being investigated by the SEC and hundreds of crypto firms are now the focus of international uh, operation crypto sweep, these two cases seem likely to be the first of many more to come. Yeah. And uh, nobody commented on that one. It's kind of interesting. So, um, with regard to all of this business, on the uh, second one, I, I would be taking the SEC to court um, because the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the SEC is exercising what I consider to be self uh, I want to say self-imposed but that's not really it <clears throat> they're assuming powers that they I don't believe they really have meaning they they've got they've got some sort of reg, regulation or whatever but it's it's something that they're exercising a precedent from some other law. You know that doesn't have anything to do with cryptocurrencies. Doesn't have anything to do with ICOs or tokens or or the legal definitions or any of that. It's that they are they're operating on an assumed association. And and I don't know. I if I were if I were big enough like these guys, Little Wit and Kugel, if they if they were operating within the boundary of what would be considered fraudulent behavior, you know, that they're say they're making they're making good on all of their transactions. You know, everybody's getting their money. There's no complaint on that front. Then I I really don't see where the SEC has any business stepping in. You know, if the, if it were a case where like the other one where you know the guy was taking funds from one thing and then investing them in cryptocurrencies, that dude's going to get wrecked with other people's money. I mean, we, we've seen that just... Pfft, how many times have we seen that? But at the same time, I think that the SEC is exercising powers that that are really not theirs to have, I, you know, especially over cryptocurrencies. I don't see them as having any quote-unquote power here. They can advise, but as far as exercising this bullshit, oh, you're not registered with us, so you gotta fucking give us money. It's just... It's the equivalent of a fucking shakedown as far as I'm concerned. And I really wish somebody would take them to court over it. Because I I really, like I said, I really don't think they have the regulatory authority that they've assumed over over this space. And I don't think that they have any, any real basis in law to be exercising like this. I think they do have basis in law for investigating fraudulent activity. 
And when I say fraudulent activity, it's I tell you one thing, you give me money based on that knowledge, but the truth is something else, and I go fuck off your money on boats and hose, and and you know you come to me asking for your money, and I tell you, oh, you know, I'm I gotta get this report done, and then I'll get you your money, and yeah, and you know, I'm just I'm stalling you, right? Then. Okay, the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, throw them at me, man. I, I'm fucking you over. Get me. There are plenty of laws against theft. There are plenty of laws against fraud. So the idea that we need to start preemptively addressing some, some people that are operating in this space just because they're not registered... I, I'm sorry, man. We're, we're in a fucking global market. And, and I really wish these guys were operating as, you know, like in the Isle of Man or some shit like that where it's kind of a legal nose <laughs> and not even U.S. regulations could be exerted over them. But again, I, I don't even think that the SEC has, has that preemptive authority, you know, that they deem that you know, because you haven't given us money and you haven't gotten the piece of paper, you're you're fraudulent and, and you need to give us money now. Pfft. What separates you from some criminal syndicate then? You know, again, if they're operating in a fraudulent manner, you know, they're offering A, they're guaranteeing that, that people are going to make returns. They're doing any of a number of things that you consider to be or that that can ever people can just fucking look at it and tell you know that's fraudulent activity you're fucking ripping people off in those cases you already have regulatory authority to hammer down on them on fraud on fraudulent claims on all kinds of shit but again the the requirement of of registration as you know that's that's something that you could be throwing people at fine fines for, fuck you you know what if i'm dealing in us dollars specifically you know my maybe then you know because i'm i'm having to deal with with existing regulated systems you know but like this guy if he was doing all of his investments and in, and people knew that you know i'm investing in crypto as long as he's actually fulfilling on the on all of his fiduciary responsibilities, you know, I'm not guaranteeing a profit or anything like that, but definitely managing the fund as if he is trying to make a profit for his customers. Um, <laughs> there's no really real, no real reason to go after the guy. That's just my perspective. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. Man, I've been trying to think of what to throw in. And, uh, you know, I haven't played any Cold Chamber in a little bit. But, you know, Clutch, they're always on my mind. Fuck it, X-Ray Visions Clutch, here on Coin Metal. And that was sixth with Vivid. And it is with that... We are going to go ahead and close out this episode. I had one more, one more uh, article, but we just don't have the time, unfortunately. But we will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, yeah, as far as what we were talking about today, I'm expecting that some people have been giving up on the idea of mining and I think that they've been trying to give up that idea for other people meaning get you to forget about it unfortunately for them the market happens to already have a sense of exactly where this thing is going and I think that the market is also understanding that it's going to need a great deal more infrastructure in order for everybody to be able to participate as we actually can instead of this pseudo participation bullshit of off chain transacting and i think sooner or later bitcoin is going to catch on to that that the real incentive 
that needs to be increased in order to make Bitcoin more viable for miners to pay attention to. And I think we're going to see this as we get closer and closer to the halvening of Bitcoin. <clears throat> is that they have to increase the block size. And it doesn't matter what transactions you are stuffing into the blocks. If it costs $20 to do the fucking transaction, it's going to be a lot less appealing to other people. I mean, to people wanting to do transactions on chain. And they're going to be looking to other options. And so in order to retain whatever market share Bitcoin does actually retain after this realization hits them over the head, um, you know, they're going to have to be that much more on it with regard to uh, expanding the block size and increasing the number of transactions in the blocks that way as opposed to this off-chain business. Anyway, it is with that I'd like to leave you this evening, and uh, we're pretty close down to the down to the wire. So I know we played Clutch earlier. Let me see if I sway by uh, Cold Chamber. Last dance of the evening. Thank you very very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. You can find me on Twitter. Also on Facebook, and I've been trying to do these and get them up onto my YouTube channel as fast as possible. So if you missed something and kind of tuned in a little bit late, you can find my episodes there as well. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. And remember, trade safe, do your homework, and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. Thanks again, and you all have an excellent evening. <laughs>